بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله وعلى آله ومن والاه اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما الحمد لله this is the second of what I've called the sacred text messages because we're living in a time of text messages and they seem to be taking people away from the text messages that we got from God. So everybody's reading their text messages from created things and they've forgotten about the text messages from the creator of things. And this is one of the great calamities. One of the things that uh, Henry David Thoreau said is don't read the times, read the eternities. And so people now, they're obsessed with news and what's the latest thing and did you hear and oh, did you know somebody's doing this and so and so's doing that and can you believe that? Did you hear Cardi B's latest? Brrr, something like that, right? So it's just crazy. People are obsessed with all these, these things. And so we're trying to get back to the text messages, the real text messages. So today I wanted to look at a couple of text messages that, um, that came from God and his messenger, so Lord, he send them. So the, and they're around the same uh, topic. So the first one is from the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَارِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إن لله وإن إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صروات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون. So this ayah which is in the Quran or it's actually a few ayahs from from 155 to 157. Allah subhanahu wa taala according to the commentators when he he says wala nabluwanakum that this is really an announcement in fact the mufassirun say it's an indhar it's like giving us a forewarning so when you have sometimes you have these bells that go off or like you have earthquake not earthquake but tsunami warnings so like in indonesia now they have all these uh, alarms that go off to let you know the tsunami's on the way so this is like god's alarm to us to let us know that tribulation is coming and this is why the Sahaba actually totally understood this. They really knew that tribulation was part of life. And in fact, it's at the heart of life. Because the Quran uh, tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created death and life. Uh, in order to test you. To, and this is what bala is. And so in this Quran, in this verse, we're being told that we will test you with something of fear. This is part of life. And even the, the, the prophets have fear. So for instance, when, when, when the angels came to Abraham, it's the, 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 it says in the Quran, nafsihi oh, khifa, that he actually felt fear in his heart. So even the, 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 uh, the prophets have fear, but, but they're courageous because courage is not not having fear. It's that you do not let fear incapacitate you. And that's why the fireman who rushes in to to save the person. It's not that he doesn't fear the fire. He does, but his courage overrides that human fear. And so we're going to be tested with fear, like fear of losing our job when, when the economy's tanking, or fear of, uh, of um, you know, your loved one dying if they get sick. All these things, these are natural occurrences uh, in, in the human condition. And then Allah says, well, jua. Hunger, and we forget that hunger was part of the pre-modern world in, in a much greater way. We're, we're living in an age of cornucopia. There's so much uh, for so many people. I mean, there are areas uh, on earth, unfortunately, there shouldn't be given what we know. But generally, no civilizations have ever had the type of sustenance and, and the ingratitude that goes with it. People traditionally had so much gratitude. And one of the things, you know, in the Muslim world, one, in some of the Arab cultures, they used to say, you know, nadifu al Medina, clean up Medina, meaning uh, finish your plate, make sure that there was nothing left on the plate because the Prophet Sallallahu uh, had such uh, high uh, uh, esteem for the blessings of Allah. In fact, one time he saw a piece of bread that had uh, on, was on the ground, and he told Aisha, "Ahsinu jiwara ni'matillah. Treat, be a good neighbor to the blessings of Allah." Uh, so that's 
just being aware of the constant blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it says, وَنَقْسٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ And also diminishment. Naqs is, can be a few different things in Arabic, but one of them is loss or diminish. You Naqis and ziyada, right? Za'id is, is excess. Uh, naqis is deficient. So we're going to be tested with loss of wealth. So we, we lose wealth and, and also of life and not just... Some people think the ayah refers simply to the loss of life, but it actually can mean diminishment of life. You can lose a tooth, you can lose a hand, you can lose uh, a leg, you, you can lose um, a life, your, your loved one, or uh, your own life. So those are all things that we can... And then thamarat, all the fruits of life, um, that uh, we will be tested with them. And, and, and then the ayah says, وَبَشِّرَ sabirin." Give glad tidings to the uh, the patient ones that are patient in the tribulation, because the response of of blessing is gratitude, but the response of tribulation is patience. And there's a lot of Muslims that say, "Oh, how long are we going to be patient?" You know, patience in the in in our tradition means a sabr ala ta'a wa sabr an al maasi. It literally means to be patient in your obedience and to be patient in not going into disobedience, to, to hold yourself back. And that's very interesting because Kierkegaard actually says something very interesting about that. Kierkegaard has an essay that he called The School of Eternity. And in that he talks, he quotes, he begins it by quoting actually Hebrews, uh, which is where it says that, um, that it says that the scripture says that the prophet learned obedience from what he suffered, which is in Hebrews 5.8. And, and so what Kierkegaard says about that is, now, if obedience directly followed suffering, it would be easy to learn. So if, if you have suffering and you learn obedience from it, that would be an easy lesson. But learning obedience is not that easy. Humanly viewed, suffering is dangerous. But even more terrible is failing to learn obedience. Yes, suffering is a dangerous schooling. But only if you do not learn obedience Ah, then it is terrible. Just as when the most powerful medicine has the wrong reaction. In this danger, a person needs God's help. Otherwise, he does not learn obedience. And if he does not learn obedience, this, then he may learn what is most corrupting, to learn craven despondency, to learn to deaden any noble fervor in it, to learn defiance and despair. So when tribulations come... We're supposed to learn obedience. We should, we should actually become obedient. And, but if we don't, and that's, he calls that the school of eternity. So that when you're learning it, that you've entered into the school of eternity. And one of the interesting things that he says about that, he says, when there is suffering, but also obedience in suffering, then you're being educated for eternity. So, so that's the patience, your patience in obedience and, and your patient in avoiding sinfulness. Then there would be no impatient hankering in your soul, no restlessness, neither of sin nor of sorrow. If you will but let it, suffering, in our tradition we would say ibtila, is the guardian angel who keeps you from slipping into the fragmentariness of the world, the fragmentariness that seeks to rip apart the soul. And for this reason... Suffering keeps you in school, this dangerous schooling, so that you may be properly educated for eternity. Because if you are educated for eternity with your patience in tribulation and your blessing, uh, your gratitude in blessing, you're ready to meet your Lord. You're, you're vertically aligned with God. But if you're just complaining, why is this happening to me? Woe is me. I mean, the ancients didn't have... They would have had fear and trepidation. And I'll tell you something about when I was in Mauritania, um, because I, uh, a lot of people just, they saw me as a Western person, that I must know something about medicine, which is one of the reasons why I la later on went and studied to go back and try to help people there, because they would bring me these people. But I, I, what really struck me is they would say things like, they would explain what they were suffering from, and then they, they would say, هَذَا ard hal." I'm just telling you, Lisa shakwa. I'm not complaining. And they lit, that's what they would say. They wanted me to understand. I'm not complaining about this. I'm just telling you because you might be able to help me. You know, but they would literally say that. Ardhal, la shakwa. I'm not complaining. 
And, and that comes from just, first of all, that we are the property of God. We, the human being, our bodies are the dominion of God. Our souls are the dominion of God. And God, yet fi mulki kama yasha. He can do whatever he wants with his mulk. And that's why we should be asking Allah for blessings constantly and really, and really be concerned about being in a state of ingratitude. Because the whining that you hear today, this is one of the few times in human history where there are so many opportunities for people, especially in the United States, and yet everybody's complaining. It's really quite extraordinary. The, the, the utter whining and complaining about conditions. What, what are you talking? Are you in a state of obedience? Because suffering, if you really are suffering, the lesson you're supposed to be learning is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The pagans, and, and I've said this before, but it really strikes me as odd. The pagan Romans would suspend the Senate when there were thunderstorms out of fear of the wrath of God. And our prophet used to pace up and down during thunderstorms doing dhikr of Allah because that was one of the reasons for punishment. And, 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 but they used to go to the temples and expiate literally expiate for their sins and ask forgiveness. Th those were pagans. And, and it's amazing that we've been given this guidance. So one of the hadith about this, you know, is that, so if you look in, in, in the ayah, and I'll get to the hadith in a second, if you look at the ayah, Allah says, idha When a calamity afflicts them, what do they say? Qalu inna lillahi. In other words, we, we belong to God. He can do whatever He wants because it, the Quran says, no calamity afflicts you except it's from God. Now there's another verse, except it's from yourself. And they're not mutually exclusive because the adab with God is to blame the self. But it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that's why you say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That's what you're supposed to say. We belong to God and to Him we return. That it's the reminder because suffering should remind you that you're you're going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, Ulaika alim sarwatum mil rabbihim wa rahma. They have the benedictions of God upon them. God is blessing them because they're in that state of, of patience, which is really a state of gratitude also, in that you're recognizing it's from God and it must be good. And this is where we get to the amazing hadith because Allah says, what would muhtadun? They are the rightly guided ones. So in the hadith, which is related in Sahih Muslim, uh, who's one of our great, uh, from the six canonical uh, imams, who wrote his famous, he, he was a student of Imam al-Bukhari and, uh, and really is second after Imam al-Bukhari in consideration amongst the great scholars. He, he was slightly less stringent um, uh, uh, conditions for accepting a hadith. Because for him, if they were in the same city at the same time, that was enough. Whereas Imam al-Bukhari had to know they actually met that he had to have witnesses that actually saw them meet. But if they were upright, Imam Muslim considered it enough to know they were in the same city. So anyway, he says, and this is on Suhaib al-Rumi. Suhaib, the, the Byzantine or the, or, or the, Euro really it means the European. And, and some, I mean, there is, there is an argument that he was from an Arab tribe, but I actually, it strikes me as, um, I think, uh, important that, that the Prophet ﷺ had an African, and a, uh, a Roman and a Persian. I mean, these represent all of the, the great civilizations uh, because technically the Indo-Europeans have the Indians and so that whole Indo-European arc falls under the, the Persians and, and, and then the Romans. But so Heba Romi uh, relates this hadith and he said that the Prophet قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ how wondrous is the affair of the believer. Inna amruhu kullahu lahu khair. All of his affair is good. وَلَيْسَ ذَارِكَ لِأَحَدًا إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ and, and that is for no one except the believer. إِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّاءُ شَكَرْ When he is given blessings, he's grateful. فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ And it was good for him, those blessings. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءُ And if he's afflicted with ضَرَّاءُ is anything harmful. So it can be like 
calamities, diseases, uh, loss of wealth, all those things that are mentioned in the ayah. Sabar, he shows patience, or she shows patience. Fakana khairan lahu, and therefore it was better for them. So this is the hadith that, that it's all good. That, that, that statement is actually a true statement. You know, it's, it's kind of said in, like a lot of people say that, uh, that, that are in some of the most difficult situations in the United States, but they say it's all good, which is, that's that kind of deep African belief uh, that, that's hard to pull out um, of uh, a certain segment of our society. But it's all good. That's ex- essentially what the hadith is saying, that if you are a believer, it's all good, that even the harm is good because there's a hikmah behind it. And this is a difference between, I once saw an interview with Christopher Reeve who had a horrible accident. And this is the guy that played Superman. And then, and then he had a terrible accident where he actually broke his neck and he was paralyzed completely. And uh, he was interviewed and the man said, how can you, you, you just seem to be dealing with this so well. And he said, look, there's two ways that can you, you can view the world. One is that it's meaningful and the other is that it's meaningless. And I choose to see it as meaningful, which is one of the reasons why I feel I've become an advocate for disabled peoples. So he took a tribulation and, and made it something else. And, and, and may, I don't know if it's from his Christian background or what, but that's what a believer would do. You know, we wouldn't wish that on our worst enemy. But if something like that happened, and there's a wonderful Iraqi that I met uh, in, in Medina, uh, really beautiful young man, and he, he unfortunately, he was completely paralyzed in, uh, in a bomb that happened, an uh, American bomb. He lives now in the United States with his father, and just beautiful spirit. It was just incredible uh, young man. But I was struck by just the, 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 the goodness and, the, and the, the acceptance of something that it came from Vulm, Undeniably, it was, it, was, it was a wrong. To bomb people is just wrong. I actually believe that bombing is a war crime, and I really think it should be. Um, it should be there should be international law against aerial bombardment because it, that's my personal belief. I really believe it's a war crime. And unfortunately, it's technically not by international law, but it should be. But anyway, so he was a victim of that. But in the end, he, he was a believer, and he was practicing this hadith that how wondrous is the affair of the believer, that his affair is all good. And, and so life is very short on earth, and you can, you can that you're suffering, whatever it is, whatever tribulation you might be in. And there's people that are in different tribulations. We also forget, Muslims, forget that tribulations aren't just uh, difficulties. Tri- there's also the tribulation of wealth, the tribulation of privilege. These are trials. Like Allah says, we have privileged some of you over others. That's in the Quran. So when you see somebody who's in a privileged state, how are they using their privilege? Are they using it for good or for ill? If you see somebody, and then uh, when the Quran said, we made some of you a tribulation for others, will you show patience? And your Lord sees everything. One of the the things about that uh, ayah uh, Ibn, Ibn Qayyim al jawziya said that Allah has made poor people a tribulation for rich people and rich people a tribulation for poor people. He's made the ignorant a tribulation for the learned and the learned a tribulation for the ignorant. He's made, and you, we could go on, the black a tribulation for the white and the white a tribulation for the black. This is the world that we're in. And so then it becomes, how are we going to, are we going to be in accordance with God and his messenger? Or are we going to be jahili people? So we, we, we see uh, the world as it is. And, 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 and that's a big difference. And then, so finally I'm going to, I'll end here with something uh, from, it's, it's something that, you know, that from the first time that I saw it, I was so struck by it. And it's in his uh, famous book, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who's one of my favorite scholars. It's in the Qawaid, where he says, Infarad al haqi ta'ara bil kamari so he said, here's the qa'idah, it's, it's the 165th principle. And he says, the uniqueness of Allah Most High in being perfect decrees the existence of imperfection in everything other than God. 
because he's unique in his perfection. So everything other than God has to be deficient. Uh, so there is no perfect being unless he most high perfects him. So it, like the prophet's perfection is from the perfection of God. So it's grace. It's not, it's not something that is inherent in the being. It's something that God made out of his favor. But this is the, the nature. And, and, and his perfecting him is a result of his grace. So imperfection is the norm, whereas perfection is exceptional. So when you see imperfection in people, you have to understand that's just the norm. Don't expect your wife to be perfect. Don't expect your husband to be perfect. Don't expect your kids to be perfect because they're not. And to do so would be criminal. You know, it's just wrong. Um, and so then he says, accordingly, seeking perfection as a norm in the world is false. To want the, like there's all these people that want this perfect world. It's called Jenna. That, that, that's the word for it. It's not dunya. Dunya is literally in the universe. We're in the bath, the toilet of, of the universe. Like this is dunya. It's the lowest place. And by that, the toilet is the place where you empty out your foulness. You get rid of, of your foulness. That's what we're here to do. This is dunya. We're in the lowest place. And it's all up from here. It's all up because even people in hell, all they can remember is God. So they're just in a state of dhikr all the time, wishing that they could be righteous, you know, wishing that they didn't waste their life away. So they're actually in a state of nadama, which is a healthy state. So this is dunya, just accept it for what it is. Thus it's been said, look at people as if they were perfect and consider imperfection to be in their nature. In other words, be kind to people, have a good opinion of people. If perfection appears in them, it is from fadl, it's grace. Because some people are perfect in certain things. Like, you know people that just really have beautiful adab, or they, uh, c character, or they're honest, or they're things. So, so in certain areas there, and then in other areas they have the shortcomings. Otherwise, what was previously mentioned is the norm. In other words, imperfection. Then he says, and this is what's really important, this is the key. Through this outlook, prudence, good feelings, companionship, and overlooking mistakes takes place. So in other words, you can, you can keep your friends and, and when you see them fall short. I mean, uh, there, there's a famous actor, D David Niven, who, who was friends with this other actor named Errol Flynn. And he said, the one thing about Errol Flynn that you could always count on is that he would let you down. <laughs> so, so there's people like that. You know, but to know that about somebody is, is useful because it's like, okay, that's just him being him or her being her. So that's just dunya. There's going to be people that will constantly let you down and just recognize that, that that's, that's who they are and, and just try to show some compassion, right? So this principle is that the world, dunya, is their dwelling and is a source. Oh, oh, and then he says, I have established a principle through which I shall... I never find repulsive anything that comes to me in this world. Okay, let me repeat that because it's, it's so interesting. He says in Arabic, Imam al-Junaid, أَصَّلْتُ أَصْرًا لَا أَتَّبَشْعُ بَعْدُهُ مَا يَرِدُ عَلَيَّ مِنَ الْعَالَمِ So I have taken as an axiom, something that is axiomatic, it's, it's a principle, it's a foundational truth about the world. And, 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 it, and, it, and it is this, he said. Once I took this as a, as a principle, I no longer find repulsive whatever comes to me from the world. And it is this. That this abode is the abode of depression, tribulation, strife, fitna, which is trials and tribulations, civil strife. وَأَنَّ الْعَالَمُ كُلُّهُ شَرٌ And all of this abode is, shar here doesn't really mean evil. What it means is it's deficient. Because the Arabs call poverty shar, because you're lacking. So it's an abode of want. It's, this is the nature of the abode that we're in. It's the abode of want. And, and, and he said, وَمِنْ حُكْمِهِ 
أنه يتلقاني بكل ما أكرهه. And from the judgment upon this world is that it will always come to me with what I don't like. It's, and and the, one of the most extraordinary hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in my estimation, is al-jannatu huffat al-jannatu bil makarih, that paradise is surrounded by distasteful things, things that we don't like. Uh, and, and, but then he said that the wahufat al-naru bil shahawat, and hell is surrounded by th- delightful things, things that entice us. And so part of what we're doing here in the dunya is, is t- to really... Uh, to deal with those, uh, avoiding those things that might be pleasurable in the moment, but in the long term are very harmful. It's like eating cake or something like that. It's pleasurable in the moment, but over time, especially if you have diabetes, you know, uh, but, but over a long time, it's very harmful. Whereas most of the foods that taste good uh, are harmful for you. And then the foods that um, are really good for you are not as tasteful. And that's kind of a metaphor for what the Prophet ﷺ was saying, that things that are good for you are often not very pleasurable, but things that are bad for you are very pleasurable. And it's very interesting that sugar, everybody loves sugar, but it rots your teeth. It, it really has a bad impact on your health, and yet it's pleasurable. And that's, that's the nature of sin. And so appetites are what take people to hell because they're going after what they want as opposed to what they need. And there's a big difference between needs and wants. And then he says, And if it greets me with what I love, that's grace from Allah. But the, 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 the basis of this dunya is the first. In other words, that it's just a place of tribulation. And that's the, you know, the, I mean, that's the first noble truth in Buddhism, is just coming to terms with the world is suffering. And, and, and then they said the second one is that the source of suffering is attachment to the world. And that's what Kierkegaard was saying is that we have to be weaned of the world like you wean a child. What does a child do when it's weaned? It cries. But once it gets weaned, it's, it, it moves to the next stage. So we are going to be weaned of the world forcefully. It's called death. And, and our tradition is, it's a sahih hadith. Consider yourselves already dead. In other words, wean yourself of this world. And the best way to do it is just to accept the world. Just accept it. Don't desire. You know, somebody once did an emotional equation where he said that disappointment was reality plus expectation. So if you don't expect anything from the world, you're always going to be happy. Even better yet, if you just expect the worst. <laughs> and this is, you know, this whole thing about the secret, you know, this new age thing is like, oh, you can, you can just put in your mind positive thoughts and it'll all. We should be positive, And that the Prophet ﷺ was very positive. In fact, somebody once asked him, can he said, oh, an ashar? And he said, La tasaruni an ashar wa salnuni an al khair. Don't ask me about evil, ask me about good. So the Prophet ﷺ was very positive, but. He knew the abode. He knew the secret of the abode. And that's why all of the tribulations, he never, it never affected him. He was always, it's called being in the hub. It's, it's, it, the eye of the hurricane is real. I mean, God made the hurricane, but he made the eye of the hurricane. And if you're in the eye of the hurricane, the hurricane's all around you. That's dunya. The eye of the hurricane is accepting the dunya as it is. And if you live in that abode, and, 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 and I'm preaching to myself because we all fall short, but if you live in that abode, you will, you will really be in a, in a good state and we should be happy. In fact, one of, one of my father's teachers was once asked, can a man be happy knowing the world's filled with suffering? And he said, oh yes, the happy man knows that the world is suffering, and yet he's happy despite that suffering. And he said, how is that possible? He said, because one of the reasons why the world is, is such a miserable place is there's so many unhappy people in it. And so don't contribute to being one of those people that make the world a miserable place. There is a moral obligation to be happy. And this is why the prophet loved uh, Said, he used to, if he heard somebody call somebody named Said, he would light up because he took it as, oh, happy one, oh, felicitous one. Yeah, Said, if he heard that, he would, he would take it, that's me. Because he was 
فَبِذَارِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ Let them rejoice in, in what, all this guidance that we've been given. Let's be happy. Not miserable. All these miserable... You know, the word for the people going to hell is shaki, which also means miserable. So don't be from the ashqiyah. Don't be from the miserable ones. Be from the su'ada, the happy ones. The felicity... Oh, ya bushara lana ma'ashar al-Islam. What? Re- rejoice, oh people of Islam. We have a rukun ghair munhadami. We have a pillar that can never be destroyed. It's called... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's the pillar. Just cling to the rope of Allah. He gave us the rope, the Prophet, he gave us the rope. And, and he said, cling to it. Wa'tasimu, the Quran says, Wa'tasimu, alhamdulillah, wa la tafarraqu, alhamdulillah. So some text messages, inshallah, and some reflections on those text messages. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. And just to let you know that that little... Um, uh, intro and outro is from my, my dear friend who passed away, Hamza Alauddin. He was a beautiful Nubian man and, and really uh, brought a lot of people to Islam through his um, singing. And so, Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him wherever he is. Amen. <laughs>